there welcome to medical tutor my name is body Ayo, and today we are going to be solving another series of questions um, that was submitted by a jam a student that wrote a jump on june 21 that is monday so my special thanks to esther one of our um, subscribers she took it upon herself to type some of the questions that was given to her in our exam yesterday monday so i want every one of us to, to do the same thing once you watch this video and you do your exam please make sure you come back to our channel and use the comment section to submit your questions and in case you want to send it directly to me on whatsapp you can send it to 081-6598-2216 so let's be first and go into what we have for today for those who are going to be having an exam early this morning ensure you watch this till the end all right um question number one here says which organism uses flim cell? Which organism uses flim cells? First, I want us to first talk about um, flim cells. What are they? What organism uses them? And what is the characteristics of such organisms? Flim cells are cells that are found in um, multinucleated organisms, especially invertebrae. An example of invertebrae in which we can find flim cells is um, the uh, platyomintis, also known by the name flatworms. Do you know what they call platyomintis or flatworms? An example of a platyomintis or flatworm is flukes. All these flukes, planaria, tubularian, yes, tapeworm that is also found in the GI or the digestive system. So, flim cells are found in such organisms. And the function of flim cell is to serve as an excretory cell. Excretory cell in, in the sense that it helps to like excrete excess water and ions from the body of a flatworm. Do you understand? So flim cells carry out the excretory function. In humans, flim cell is likened to be nephrons. In human nephrons function by excreting excessive water and some other uh, myonic contents in the body. And nephrons make up the whole kidney that is in the body. So the kidney is the organ of excretion. However, it is made up of nephrons. And this nephron is also doing the same function, similar to the flim cells that we are talking about here. And I tell you the other time that we can find flim cells in organisms such as the flukes such as the tapeworm in our gi as well and uh, other organisms that can have it are like the rotifiers as well the rotifiers can have it all right um another feature of platyomintis or flatworms that possess these flim cells is that platyomintis have no um cavity body cavity they are acylomates and they only have one um entrance in their gi platyomintis do not have enough they only have one mouth and that mouth is where they eat. It's also through that mouth that they also excrete their food substances. And that's why flame cell is very important in excretion of water from the body of such organisms. And the importance of flame cell is that when there's too much water in the body, like I told you, it will regulate it by excreting. It also regulates uh, myonic concentration as well. Now, by doing so, flame cell is able to maintain the osmotic pressure in any organism that contains it, such as the flatworms and the rosifiers. So flame cells are found in rotifiers, in platyomintins or flatworms. So, um, question number two says, the most common biome, the most common biome in Nigeria is, first, what is a biome? A biome is a vegetative and wildlife region. A biome is a vegetative and wildlife region. It is usually very, very large, a very large expanse of land. Uh, I believe we all know some examples of environment that we have in the old world or in Nigeria in particular. We have the tropical rainforest, we have the savannas. You know, we have different types of savannas as well the Guinea savanna, short grass savanna, tall grass savanna, um, wide land savanna, Sahel savanna. So, aside from that, we also have the desert. So, now the most common biome in Nigeria, in fact, from the once I listed just now, you know that the most common one is savannas. There are different types of savannas, wide land, etc., and so much as possible. So the most common in Nigeria is the savanna. And the most common among the savannas in Nigeria is the woodland and tall grass savanna. The most common biome in Nigeria is savanna. And the most common among the savanna is the woodland and the tall grass savanna. So um, question number three. In question number three, the biome that is with the least amount of rain annually is the biome with the least amount of rain annually is now before i give go into the answer of this you will recall that in our first um, video concerning 2021 jam questions for june 19 students we used some options and that was because the student that provided the question was able to give the options out 
So uh, when this was actually submitted, the options were not given. So we did. I did my best to research the answers for all this, and I'm very sure it corresponds to whatever is going to be given to you in your jump exam. Should these questions be repeated? So always make sure you to you try to like. If you try to remember options, well, they're all good, but we we'll really appreciate the questions more, much more better than the answers. So the more the question you have, the more we're able to compile for other students. Okay, thanks so much in advance, and let's go into number three. The bottom with the least amount of rain annually is now i don't need to repeat myself if you remember in number two we said we have biomes such as the savannah the tropical rainforest and the deserts in nigeria among these three you should know that the tropical rainforest we have a large amount of rain just from the word tropical rainforest followed by the savannah then followed by who by the deserts so deserts have the least amount of rain in all biomes no matter what you don't even think much deserts are dry places the water that is there is very minuscule maybe 300 mm per year very very minuscule so the biome that has the least amount of rain is the desert no need to think much question number four what do terrestrial animals use for rest respiration what do terrestrial animals use for respiration remember we have different types of animal we have the aquatic animals the terrestrial animals and for the terrestrial animal we have the arboreal as well but here we let's just focus on the aquatic and the terrestrial animals for the aquatic animals we're talking about animals that live inside water right Whereas for the terrestrial, we're talking about animals that live on land. So now, animals that live on land use few structures in their body for respiration. For example, in vertebrates, like humans, we use lungs for respiration. So if you see lungs in the option, you pick it, it's the correct answer. Another thing that is also used, for example, insects. Um, well, should we consider insects as animals? Well, do not, don't let us include insects. Let's just use the, the generalized form. For example, let's look at um okay, look at the toads, the toads and frogs. Even though the um the toads and frogs, some of them are actually aquatic, but they are also staying on land. And because of that, toads also have lungs in their body, amphibians, they have lungs. Unlike fishes, fishes are living in water, so they only have gills for respiration. But for toads, for some vertebrates that we already know, they have lungs for respiration. Okay, um question number five. The adaptation of frogs or toads to obtain food is the adaptation of frogs or toads to obtain food is talking about adaptation. We're talking about what an organism has that helps it to survive well in whatever environment it has been placed in. For example, fishes are able to survive in water because of the presence of gills, and that's why if a human decides to go and swim inside water, you can't stay in for too long unless you're using an oxygen box. So it's very important because there's no gills actually in humans. So, but on land, we're able to survive because we have lungs, whereas fishes can't survive on land because they don't have lungs. So, the adaptation of frog or toads to obtain food is what helps them to obtain food wherever they are, whether in water or on land. And few adaptation, adaptation of such includes their long tongue, their long sticky tongue. If you've ever watched all these videos, cartoon, whatever, and I Joe wide, you know that when frogs want to eat, they are able to stay in the same place and stretch out their long tongue to capture an insect that is few meters away um few centimeters away from them and they will move without moving they're able to capture food from a long distance without moving forward so for example maybe um the frog wants to like budge into the nest of some insects and actually it sees that there will be danger if it budges into that place all it has to do is just stay in a distance and extend its tongue and like try to take the coil around the food from a long distance and swallow it that's all they can also do the same thing for butterflies for example Frogs and toads are able to extend their sticky tongue to capture butterflies from the air. So despite the butterfly flying, they are able to like capture it from the air. Without, you know, toads and frogs, they can't fly, they can only jump. So the only way they can obtain their food from the atmosphere is to like stretch out their sticky tongue. Um, tongue. And the adaptation of the frogs and toads is the location of their mouth. If you, if you recall the image of a toad or frog, and frog in your head, you know that the eyes of frogs or toads are located on the uppermost part of their head. It's like vertically aligned on the uppermost part of their head. And the mouth is now placed um, horizontally, widely horizontal. So this enables frog to be able to open their mouth widely to like encompass a very large food. So it isn't a small part, uh, it isn't a small mouth because if it is very small, it won't be able to swallow whatever they want to swallow. So it means they will have to be feeding on small, small organism and that won't be beneficial. So in order to meet up for their appetite, they have a very large, wide, horizontal mouth to accommodate whatever large food they want to swallow. 
so those are the two adaptations one the location of the mouth which is horizontal and wide second the long sticky tongue which can be used to capture food from a long distance whether in the air or on land so question number six <coughs> what keeps the structure of cells in plants what keeps the structure of cells in plants in plants we have some things that animal cells do not have for example in plants we have the vacuole we have the cell wall which is made up of cellulose and some pectin whereas in animals we have the cell membrane made up of phospholipids and proteins so in cell plants the structures are the factors that are responsible for keeping the structure to make it definite remember in animal animal cells do not have a definite structure but plant cells have definite structure so what helps it to maintain that definite structure is because of the presence of a large water vacuole not just vacuole alone we also have food vacuoles as well and they also have a presence of cellulose in their cell wall. Their cell wall is very, very aligned with pectin, even though it's not that much with pectin and cellulose and some other little, little factors. For example, a large nucleus as well. So especially the vacuum, the vacuum contributes a lot because of the large presence of a vacuum in the cell um, cytoplasm. It is able to like make the cell turgid and rigid. So it gives it that definite shape. So what gives the structure of the cells in plants is the cell wall. And it is made up of the cellulose and few amounts of pectins and also the vacuoles which are present in the cytoplasm which are responsible for the um, turgidity of the cell all right question number seven sea anemones sea anemones use what type of skeleton sea anemones use what type of skeleton first we need to talk about what the skeleton is the skeleton is, is the framework of an organism and uh, we have three types we have the exoskeleton which is found in insects we have the endoskeleton which is found in humans endo means inside exo means outside and the third type of skeleton we have is the hydrostatic skeleton from the word hydro hydro means water hydrostatic skeleton is a skeleton that is built based on water water force for example if you've seen um these um, all these tapeworms roundworms earthworm especially earthworm before they're all, all using um hydrostatic skeleton it's helps them to move with the aid of the fluid present in their body so most of these organisms are always filled with fluid with water and they are most times found in moist region for example the earthworm earthworms are always boring into the sand so that they can absorb enough water and remain moisturized you know, they don't like to be exposed inside the sun it's very rare for you to say earthworm inside the sun because it gets dry so they need the water for the hydrostatic movement so the type of skeleton in the sea anemone is the hydrostatic skeleton and that's one, one of the important reasons why sea anemones are found inside the aquatic region. So, hydrostatic skeleton. Question number eight, which is very important. I want you guys to listen to this very well. I will put an image here for you to look at as well as I explain. Now, when um, a man and a woman marries, let's read the question. It says, if a man with blood group AB marries a woman with blood group O, what will be the blood groups of their children? Listen again. A man with blood group AB marries a woman with blood group O. What will be the blood group of their children? Now, remember, when um, fertilization occurs, when fertilization occurs, fertilization, um, the, the sperm and the egg is containing one, one donation from each of the parents, not two donations, one, one donation. For example, the sperm carries Y, the egg carries uh, yeah the sperm carries y the egg carries an x or the, the sperm carries one x the egg also carries another x so it isn't like um one sperm is carrying two x or maybe two y mm -mm, no so each parent donates just one 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 each of their own personality to give to the offspring so now if we have a man marrying a woman here and the man is having a b and the woman is having o the man can only donate one of this a b the man can't donate the entire AB at the same time, no. So look at it. If the man donates A, A will cross multiply with O. So the blood group of the baby or the offspring is going to be A. Whereas the genotype will be AO. Now, if the man donates the B part of the AB, the blood group is going to be B. Whereas the genotype is going to be BO. Do you guys understand? The man can't donate everything at the same time for just one single offspring, no. For each offspring, they are going to have their own genetic makeup. So let's assume the, uh, the man is going to give birth to four kids. There's a likely possibility, or, or there's 50% possibility of the man having kids, off, offsprings with just a blood group. And there's also another 50 of him having blood, um, offsprings with blood group of B. 
and their junior type AO or BO. So I repeat again, A with O we form block group A and genotype AO, whereas B with O we form the block group B and genotype BO. The man can only give one of these to one of these at the same time for one single offspring. So um, what will be the block group of their children? We already talked about that. A or B, simple as ABC. So question number nine. The first step of seed germination is dash. The first step of seed germination is dash. Seed germination has to do with the process of growth of seed after plantation. Now, when you plant seed, the first step of the germination is called imbibition. I will repeat, imbibition, I-M-B-I-B-I-T-I-O-N, I-M-B-I-B-I-T-I-O-N. Imbibition means absorbing water. The seed, the first thing the seed does inside the ground is to absorb a lot of water. The water will pour inside of it. And the essence of water pouring inside the seed, which is the second step, is to activate some enzymes. These enzymes are also known as growth enzymes. Now, the third step is that the roots of the seed will start growing downwards into the soil to absorb even more water. The, first, the fourth step is that the, after the root has grown, the shoot will also grow upward towards the sun. And the fifth step is that the shoots that has already grown up will begin to develop branches, leaves, stem, and whatever. So I will repeat again, the first step of seed germination is called imbibition, that is absorbing water. And the essence of absorbing water is to activate enzymes in the second step. In the third step, the roots will grow. In the fourth step, the shoots will grow. And in the fifth, fifth step, leaves and stem and branches will begin to grow. So the first step is called imbibition. Question number 10, which is the last one for our submission here. What determines inherited characteristics? What determines inherited characteristics? Inherited characteristics is determined by the gene, by the genetic makeup. Or let me just use the word gene rather. And you all know that gene is the basic unit of hereditary, the basic unit of inheritance, whatever you want to call it. And it is transferred from the parent to the offspring. So the only thing that will determine what characteristics you have is what you have <coughs> inherited from your parents. So if your parents be they are both black, there's a very high possibility of you having the phenotypic characteristics of um having that phenot phenotypic characteristic of being black. If they are very hairy, you you might be hairy. If they are tall, you might be tall. So long it's dominant um characteristics. You're going to be if they are short, you're going to be short. So inherited characteristics is determined by the gene you inherit. So the correct answer here is gene or genetic makeup, whichever one you see in your um, option. So that solves all we have for today. Uh, I really want to appreciate Esther once again for submitting these entries um, as early as possible. Uh, for all of our viewers currently, I would really like to um, implore you. You know, there's no, I know it, it will cost you an effort to remember all of these questions, but actually you're also paving a way for others. And I will really, really appreciate that. So today after your exam, ensure whatever questions you remember, you type it to the comment section. Once you are done and after of the exam, I pray for God's great success in your exam, okay? Once you are out of the exam hall, make sure you come to this place immediately and share with us your experience in the comment section and also add your questions there. Now your experience and your questions are going to be made into a video for other Jambites who are coming up to watch. And if you want your face to be featured, you can also send me um, a, a video on WhatsApp where you will record your experience. Uh, we don't mind featuring your face on our YouTube channel here. Yeah. So um, thanks for watching. I really appreciate your presence here today. And I pray for your great success in today's exam. And uh, at the end of everything, uh, your admission, the one you've been, uh, you are writing all these exams for, is going to come into one this year in Jesus' name. So um, once again, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. That's very, very important.